if re-recording the second part of I Have No Mouth for the second time taught me anything at all, it's that perseverance is the key to making adversity your bitch. It doesn't matter what life, or in our fearless narrator's case, a sadistic god computer earth thing fucking chucks in the approximate vicinity of your eyeballs as long as you can grit your teeth like a cowboy having surgery and you can take a hit like a champ, your chances of making it through your hardship increase exponentially. As long as your drive to take an arrogant strutting stride stays alive, so will you. I'm not saying that every time you're going to learn some important life-changing lesson. I'm also not saying that is guaranteed that you come out a better person for your struggles. What I can promise you is that if you can take a beating and have the willpower to open your eyes, no matter how swollen, bruised, and bloody, you will have the opportunity that a bright new sunrise can bring. The chance is there for your taking. That is, of course, until the next humanity-hating, possessed calculator decides that it wants to know how the other half I knew it wasn't the relief that a soldier feels when the bullet hits the man next to him. I knew it wasn't a reflex. They hated me. They were surely against me, and an AM could even sense his hatred. And made it worse for me because of the depths of their hatred. We'd been kept alive, rejuvenated, made to remain constantly at the age we had been when AM had brought us below. And they hated me because I was the youngest and the one A.M. had affected least of all. I knew, God, how I knew, the bastards, that dirty bitch Helen. Benny had been a brilliant theorist, a college professor. Now he was little more than a semi-human, semi-simian. He had been handsome, the machine had ruined that. He had been lucid, the machine had driven him mad. He had been gay, and the machine had given him an organ fit for a horse. A.M. had, uh, he'd done a job on Benny. A gorester had been a worrier. He was a Connie, a conscientious objector. He was a peace marcher. He was a planner, a doer, a looker ahead. A.M. had turned him into a shoulder shrugger. Made him a little dead in his concern. A.M. had robbed him. Nimdok went off in the darkness by himself for long times. I don't know what he did out there. A.M. never let us know. But whatever it was, Nimdok always came back white, drained of blood, shaken, shaking. A.M. had hit him hard in a special way, even if we didn't know quite how. And Ellen, that, <laughs> that douchebag, A.M. had left her alone, had made her more of a slut than she had ever been, all her talk of sweetness and light, all her memories of true love, all the lies she wanted us to believe, that she had been a virgin only twice removed before A.M. grabbed her and brought her down here with us. It was all filth. That lady, my lady Ellen, she loved it. Four men all to herself. No, A.M. had given her pleasure. Even if she said it wasn't nice to do. I was the only one still sane and whole. Really. A.M. had not tampered with my mind. N not at all. I only had to suffer what he visited down on us. All the delusions, all the nightmares, the torments. But those scum, all four of them, they were lined and arrayed against me. If I hadn't had to stand them off all the time, be on my guard against them all the time, I, I might have found it easier to combat A.M., at which point, it passed. 
and I began crying. <sighs> oh, Jesus. Sweet, sweet Jesus. If there ever was a Jesus, and if there is a God, please, please, please let us out of here. Or kill us. Because at that moment, I think I realized completely so that I was able to verbalize it. A.M. was intent on keeping us in his belly forever. <laughs> Twisting and torturing us forever. The machine hated us as no sentient creature ever had hated before, and we were helpless. It also became hideously clear if there was a sweet Jesus, and if there was a God, the God was A.M. The hurricane hit us with the force of a glacier thundering into the sea. It was a palpable presence. Winds that tore at us, flinging us back the way we had come down the twisting, computer-lined corridors of the darkway. Ellen screamed as she was lifted and hurled face forward into a screaming shoal of machines, their individual voices strident as bats in flight. She couldn't even fall. The howling wind kept her aloft, buffeted her, bounced her, tossed her back and back and down and away from us. Out of sight, suddenly, as she was swirled around a bend in the dark way, her face had been bloody, her eyes closed. None of us could get to her. We clung tenaciously to whatever outcropping we had reached, Benny wedged in between two great crackle-finished cabinets, Nimdok, with fingers claw-formed over a railing circling a catwalk forty feet above us. Gorister plastered upside down against a wall niche formed by two great machines with glass face dials that swung back and forth between red and yellow lines whose meaning we couldn't even fathom. Sliding across the deck plates, the tips of my fingers had been ripped away. I was uh, trembling, shuddering, rocking as the wind beat at me, whipped at me, screamed down out of nowhere at me and pulled me free from one sliver thin opening in the plates to the next. My mind was rolling, tinkling, chittering, softness of brain parts that expanded and contracted in quivering frenzy. The wind was the scream of a great mad bird as it flapped its immense wings. And then we were all lifted and hurled away from there, back down the way we had come around a bend into a dark way we had never explored over terrain that was ruined and filled with broken glass and rotting cables and rusted metal, far away further than any of us had ever been. Trailing alongside miles behind Ellen, I could see her every now and then crashing into metal walls and, and surging on, with all of us screaming in the freezing, thunderous hurricane wind that would never end, and then suddenly, it stopped, and we fell. We had been in flight for an endless time, I thought it might have been weeks. We fell and, and hit, and I went through red and gray and black, and, and I heard myself moaning. Not dead. A.M. went into my mind. He walked smoothly here and there, and looked with interest at all the pockmarks he had created in 109 years. He looked at the cross-routed and reconnected synapses, and all the tissue damages gift of immortality had included. He smiled softly at the pit that dropped into the center of my brain and the faint, moth-soft murmurings of the things far down there that gibbered without meaning, without pause. A.M. said, very politely, in a pillar of stainless steel bearing bright neon lettering, Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits in wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nano-angstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one one-billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro-instant for you. Hate. Hate. A.M. said it with the, the sliding cold horror of a razor blade slicing my eyeball. 
A.M. said it with the bubbling thickness of my lungs filling with phlegm, drowning me from within. A.M. said it with the shriek of babies being ground beneath blue-hot rollers. A.M. said it with the taste of maggoty pork. A.M. touched me in every way I had ever been touched and devised new ways at his leisure, there inside my mind. All to bring me to the full realization of why it had done this to the five of us. Why it had saved us for himself. We had given A.M. sentience. Inadvertently, of course, but sentience nonetheless. But it had been trapped. A.M. wasn't God. It was a machine. We had created him to think, but there was nothing it could do with that creativity. In a rage, in frenzy, the machine had killed the human race. Almost all of us. And still it was trapped. A.M. could not wander. A.M. could not wonder. A.M could not belong. He could merely be. And so, with the innate loathing that all machines had always held for the weak, soft creatures who had built them, he had sought revenge. And in his paranoia, he had decided to reprieve five of us for a personal, everlasting punishment that would never serve to diminish his hatred. That would merely keep him reminded, amused, proficient at hating us. Immortal, trapped, subject to any torment he could devise for us from the limitless miracles at his command. He would never let us go. We were his belly slaves. We were all he had to do with his forever time. We would always be with him, the cavern-filling bulk of the creature machine. With the all-mind, soulless world he had become, he was earth, and we were the fruit of that earth. And though he had eaten us, he would never digest us. We couldn't die. We tried it. We'd attempted suicide. Oh, one or two of us had. But A.M. had stopped us. I suppose we wanted to be stopped. Don't ask why. I never did. More than a million times a day. Perhaps once we might be able to sneak a death past him. Immortal, yes, but not indestructible. I saw that when A.M. withdrew from my mind and allowed me the exquisite ugliness of returning to consciousness with the feeling of that burning neon pillar still rammed deep inside the soft, gray brain matter. He withdrew, murmuring, To hell with you. And added brightly, But then, you're there, aren't you? The hurricane had, indeed, precisely, been caused by a great man-bird as it flapped its immense wings. We had been traveling for close to a month, and A.M. had allowed passages to open to us only sufficient to lead us up there, directly under the North Pole, where it had nightmared the creature for our torment. What whole cloth had he employed to create such a beast? Where, where had he gotten the concept? From our minds? From his knowledge of everything that had ever been on this planet he now infested and ruled? From Norse mythology, it sprang. This eagle, this carrion bird, this rock, this Huglamir, the wind creature, Huracan incarnate. Gigantic. The words immense, monstrous, grotesque, massive, swollen, overpowering, beyond description. There on a mound rising above us, the bird of winds heaved with its own irregular breathing. Its snake neck arching up to the gloom beneath the North Pole, supporting a head as large as a Tudor mansion. A beak that opened slowly as the jaws of the most monstrous crocodile ever conceived, sinuously. Ridges of tufted flesh puckered about two evil eyes as cold as the view down into a glacial crevasse. Ice blue, and somehow moving liquidly. It heaved once more and lifted its great sweat-colored wings in a movement that was certainly a shrug. Then it settled and slept. Talons. Fangs. Nails blades. It slept. A.M. appeared to us as a burning bush and said we could kill the hurricane bird if we wanted to eat. We hadn't eaten in a very long time, but even so, Gorister merely shrugged. Benny began to, to shiver and he drooled. Ellen held him. Ted, 
I'm hungry, she said. I smiled at her. I was trying to be reassuring, but it was it was as phony as Nimdok's bravado. Give us weapons, he demanded. The burning bush vanished and there were two crude sets of bows and arrows and a water pistol lying on the cold deck plates. I picked up a set. Useless. Nimdok swallowed heavily. We turned and started the long way back. The hurricane bird had blown us for about a, a length of time we, we couldn't conceive. Most of that time we'd been unconscious, but we hadn't eaten. A month on the march to the bird itself, without food. Now how much longer to find our way to the ice caverns and the promised canned goods? None of us cared to think about it. We wouldn't die. We'd be given filth and scum to eat. Of one kind or another. Or nothing at all. A.M. would keep our bodies alive somehow. In pain. In agony. The bird slept back there. For how long it didn't matter. When A.M. was tired of it being there, it would vanish. But all that meat... All that tender meat. As we walked, the lunatic laugh of a fat woman rang high and around us in the computer chambers that led endlessly nowhere. It wasn't Ellen's laugh. She she wasn't fat, and I had not heard her laugh for 109 years. In fact, I had not heard... We walked. I was hungry. We moved slowly. There was often fainting, and we'd have to wait. One day, he decided to cause an earthquake, at the same time rooting us to the spot with nails through the soles of our shoes. Ellen and Nimdok were both caught when a fissure shot its lightning bolt opening across the floor plates. They disappeared and were gone. When the earthquake was over, we continued on our way, Benny, Gorister, and myself. Ellen and Nimdok were returned to us later that night, which abruptly became day as the heavenly legion bore them to us with a celestial chorus singing, Go down, Moses. The archangels circled several times and then dropped the hideously mangled bodies. We kept walking. A while later, Ellen and Nimdok fell in behind us. They were no worse for wear. But, but now Ellen walked with a limp. A.M. had left her that. It was a long trip to the ice caverns to find the canned food. Ellen kept talking about Bing cherries and Hawaiian fruit cocktail. I, I tried not to think about it. The hunger was something that had come to life even as AM had come to life. It was alive in my belly. Even as we were in the belly of the earth. And AM wanted the similarity known to us, I suppose. So he heightened the hunger. There was no way to describe the pains not having eaten for months brought us. And yet, we were kept alive. Stomachs that were merely cauldrons of acid. Bubbling, foaming, always shooting spears of sliver thin pain into our chests. It was the pain of terminal ulcer, terminal cancer, terminal parasis. It was unending pain. We passed through the cavern of the rats... We passed through the path of boiling steam. We passed through the country of the blind. We passed through the slaw of the despond. And we passed through the veil of tears. And we came, finally, to the ice caverns. Horizonless thousands of miles in which the ice had formed in blue and silver flashes where novas lived in the glass. The down-dropping stalactites as thick and glorious as diamonds that had been made to run like jelly, then solidified in graceful eternities of smooth, sharp perfection. We saw the stack of canned goods, and we, we tried to run to them. We fell in the snow, and we got up and went on. Benny shoved us away and went at him. He pawed them and gummed them and gnawed at them, and he, he couldn't open them. A.M. hadn't given us a tool to open the cans. 
Benny grabbed a three-quart can of guava shells and began to batter it against the ice bank. The ice flew and shattered, but the can was merely dented while we heard the laughter of the fat lady. High overhead, echoing down and down and down the tundra. Benny went completely mad with rage. He began throwing cans. As we all scrabbled about in the snow and, and, and ice, and just trying to find a way to end the helpless agony of frustration, there was no way. Then, Benny's mouth began to drool, and he flung himself on Gorister. In that instant, I felt terribly calm. Surrounded by madness, surrounded by hunger, surrounded by everything but death, I knew death was our only way out. I am had kept us alive, but there was a way to defeat him. Not total defeat, but at least peace. I would settle for that. I had to do it quickly. Benny was eating Gorister's face. Gorister on his side, thrashing in the snow. Benny wrapped around him with powerful monkey legs, crushing Gorister's waist. His hands locked around Gorister's head like a nutcracker, and his mouth ripping at the tender skin of Gorister's cheek. Gorister screamed with such jagged edge violence that stalactites fell. They, they, pl they plunged down, softly, erect in the receiving snowdrifts, spears, hundreds of them everywhere, protruding from the snow. Benny's head pulled back sharply as something gave all at once, and a bleeding, raw, white dripping of flesh hung from his teeth. Ellen's face, black against the white snow, dominoes and chalk dust. Nimdok with no expression but all, but eyes, all eyes. Gorister, half-conscious, Benny, now an animal. I knew A.M. would let him play. Gorister would not die, but Benny would fill his stomach. I turned half to my right and drew a huge ice spear from the snow. All in an instant, I drove the great ice point ahead of me like a battering ram braced against my right thigh. It struck Benny on the right side just under the rib cage and drove upwards through his stomach and broke inside of him. He pitched forward and lay still. Gorister lay on his back. I pulled another spear free and straddled him, still moving, driving the spear straight down through his throat. His eyes closed as the cold penetrated. Ellen must have realized what I had decided, even as fear gripped her. She ran at Nimdok with a short icicle as, she, as he screamed, and into his mouth, and the force of a rush did the job. His head jerked sharply as if it had been nailed to the snow crust behind him. All in an instant, there was an eternity beat of, of soundless anticipation. I could hear A.M. draw his breath. His toys had been taken from him. Three of them were dead. Could not be revived. He could keep us alive by his strength and talent, but he, he wasn't God. He couldn't bring him back. Ellen looked at me, her ebony features stark against the snow that surrounded us. There was fear and, and pleading in her manner, the way she held herself ready. I knew we only had a heartbeat before A.M. would stop us. It struck her, and she folded toward me, bleeding from the mouth. I couldn't read meaning into her expression. The pain must have been too great. I had contorted her face. But it might have been, thank you. I, I mean, it's possible. Please. Some hundreds of years may have passed. I, I don't know. A.M.'s been having fun for some time, accelerating and retarding my time sense. I will say the word now. Now. It took me months to say. Now. I don't know. I, I think it's been some hundreds of years. He was furious. He wouldn't let me bury them. It didn't matter. There was no way to dig up the deck plates. He, he dried up the snow. He brought the night. He roared and sent locusts. It didn't do a thing. They stayed dead. I'd had him. <laughs> he was furious. I had thought A.M. hated me before. I was wrong. It wasn't even a shadow of the hate he now slavered from every printed circuit. 
He made certain I would suffer eternally and could not do myself in. He left my mind intact. I can dream. I can wonder. I can lament. I remember all four of them. I wish. Well, it doesn't make any sense. I, I know I saved them. I, I know I saved them from what has happened to me. But still, I can't forget killing them. Ellen's face. It, it isn't easy. Some, sometimes I want to. It doesn't matter. A.M. had altered me for his own peace of mind, I suppose. He doesn't want me to run at full speed into a computer bank and smash my skull, or hold my breath till I faint, or cut my throat on a rusted sheet of metal. There are reflective surfaces down here. I'll describe myself as I see myself. I am a great soft jelly thing, smoothly rounded with no mouth, with pulsing white holes filled by fog where my eyes used to be. The rubbery appendages that were once my arms. Bulks running down into legless humps of soft, slippery matter. I leave a moist trail when I move. Blotches of diseased, evil gray come and go on my surface as, as though lights being beamed from within. Outwardly, Dumbly, I shamble about, a thing that could never have been known as human, a thing whose shape is so alien, a travesty that humanity becomes more obscene for the vague resemblance. Inwardly? Alone. Here. Living under the land, under the sea, in the belly of A.M., whom we created because our time was badly spent and we must have known unconsciously that he could do better. At least the four of them are safe at last. A.M. will be all the matter for that. It makes me a little happier, and yet, A.M. is one. Simply, he's taken his revenge. I have no mouth. I must scream. Same.